Just a quick introduction, my name is Jason Shalon. I'm the regional SARE educator uh, for Delaware in the Eastern Shore of Maryland. This is Baron Rogers. Uh, he's the SARE state coordinator for Maryland. Uh, and he's the, uh, what's your title, director of farms program at a uh, UMES? Oh, what is my title? Uh, the Whatever. Small farm program coordinator, uh, but for the SARE, I'm the SARE state uh, PDP coordinator. And the PDP is professional development program. Right. And we're going to be talking mostly about uh, SARE Farmer Grants today, and you'll learn a little about what, about what that is. Uh, first, sustainable agriculture. Um, it's kind of become one of those buzzwords where it's kind of lost a little bit of its meaning, um, but in the, the heart of it, um, there's, there's three main principles. Uh, one, it's got to be profitable, uh, it's got to protect the natural resources, and it's got to be good for the farmer lifestyle. So there's, this is the farm bill definition, but really it comes down to those three things. It's got to be good for the farmer, it's got to be profitable, and it's got to be good for the, the natural resources as well. Um, this is our outcome statement. Um, when you're writing a grant for any organization, it's good to just think back at what the purpose of the organization is. Uh, and the, the outcome statement kind of sums it up pretty nice. Um, just to sum it up really quickly, agriculture has to be diversified, profitable, provide healthful products, uh, conducted by farmers who manage resources wisely and who are satisfied with their lifestyles and have a positive influence on the communities. Uh, so quickly, SARE is a national program that's broken into four regions. We're in the Northeast region. If you're in Virginia, then you're in the uh, Southern SARE region. There's two main sides of what SARE does. One are uh, the competitive grants, which we're gonna talk about in a little while. Uh, the farmer grants and partnership grants are, are mainly what, what you guys could be interested in, sometimes sustainable, sustainable community ones. Uh, some of the other ones are larger uh, ones for uh, extension universities, things like that. The other side are publications, national publications, um, speaker funds, they do all kinds of bulletins, uh, online resources, videos. It's really a, uh, a huge array of information they have. Um, you can see here, uh, I think the, the, the best, best thing to look at is the success rate, uh, where farmer and partnership grants are really, and this year was uh, uh, through, the, through the reverse, 2010, this is, we don't have the data from the uh, 2011 uh, yet, but. Um, over 40% is really high for a competitive grants program. So the Northeast SARE Farmer Grant, we'll start getting into that. What is it? It's a grant to explore innovative ideas. So they don't just pay money to farmers to improve their farm or to uh, expand their farm. It's not like some of the other USDA programs. It's uh, research based to explore innovative ideas. Um, Really the idea is, I, I've spent a fair amount of uh, time on, on farms um, as a student worker and doing different things and really, and the farmers I talk to, you come up with ideas all day long about what might work, what might not work and most of the time you just don't want to take on that risk uh, of time and money. Um, Sarah just kind of fits that, that void where they can, they can uh, encourage you to try some new things, try some different things, and hopefully gain some knowledge and then spread that to the farmers around you. Um, the idea is not to recreate the wheel, that's kind of the old saying, uh, you're, you're working from previous things and, and moving forward. You're not, you're building upon research that's already out there. Um, you're seeking new knowledge that other farmers can use and address questions that are directly linked to improved profits, better stewardship of resources, and stronger rural communities. And there's kind of the three, the three things that always come back up. How, these are just some examples, but field trials uh, are generally how it works. You, you're, you're trying, you're doing a research project on your farm, um, then doing things to disseminate the, uh, the research, like, such as iron farm demonstrations. Um, you can also include marketing research, uh, other inventions, Project, the project must have an outreach component. Um, this is often one of the easiest things. You have to have a technical advisor, and we'll get into that a little bit later, but that is usually somebody from Cooperative Extension or University, uh, and they, 
that's what they do is outreach. Uh, so if you have one of those technical advisors on, they can really uh, take the brunt of, of the outreach. So there's no reason to cut, cut yourself short uh, for that part of the application. Um, before we go too much farther, who can apply for a farmer grant? This is something that's just a rule that's set in stone. You have to file a Schedule F for the, with the IRS. Um, if you don't know what that is, you have to have $1,000 gross revenue, um, that taxable gross revenue. Uh, if you don't file a Schedule F, then they just can't pay you. It's just one of those lines they had to set. Um, you can be full or part-time. Doesn't have to, doesn't matter how big your farm is, it's just that Schedule F. If you do that, then you're eligible. Uh, has to be for-profit operations that are currently selling farm products, crop or animal, on a regular basis. Uh, you need to have a technical advisor. I mentioned that before. Uh, find one early on in the process. If you can't find one, then let me know, let Baron know. Um, contact uh, the Northeast Sarah region directly because there's people out there that will be willing to help you until along the entire process of the application and through the research and through the outreach. SARE funds can be used for your time, your employee's time, in other words, your labor. Um, that's a little surprising to people sometimes. Usually what we see most often probably is $20, $25 an hour. Um, really they just want you to be reasonable. In the book I think it says up to $40 an hour, but it, I've been on multiple rounds of review committees and whenever we see $40 an hour, they better really be defending defending that because that's just a lot of money. Um, most of the time when we go out to farms uh, or farmers that have got these grants, they say they, they cut their time short or they, they applied for too little time. Because um, when it comes down to it, it took way more than they were expecting. Uh, so I if anything, you can bring your rate down a little bit and bring the hours up. Um, you just got to be reasonable. Uh, the other good thing about Sarah, I might as well mention now, is that if something doesn't seem right, whether it's the budget or, or uh, anything in the process, then they'll contact you directly and they'll ask you just to change something, ask you questions about it, uh, and that's really something that's, that's a, exceptional for SARE. Uh, other grant organizations really don't, don't work like that. Uh, they can fund project materials, project-related services, uh, travel, if you can, as long as you can defend it, it's necessary for the project. Postage, printing, phone, outreach expenses. expenses. Again, they can be funding it, but you can be getting a lot of help from extension uh, people that do this for a living. Uh, so you don't necessarily need to feel like that's too much of a time burden. Um, they can compensate technical advisors, collaborators, et cetera, but keep in mind, people in extension really aren't supposed to get paid, uh, you know outside like that. Usually that's meant for if you have industry experts, um, if you're bringing in, you know, depending on, depending on what your, your topic is. We've seen bee projects where they have, you know, basically a professional uh, beekeeper come in um, to, to help with different things and that's, uh, that's where they can uh, be funded. Rental equipment specifically needed for your project. They can't pay for per equipment purchases. Um, and you obviously have to defend that it's necessary to get your project done. They do not fund anything more than $15,000. That's an easy one. Um, general overhead costs, so they, every round of grants we get ones where we feel like it, they're just trying to get fund what they're already doing. And that's obviously not something that SARE is meant to do. Uh, capital expenses, this can be a little bit of a gray area. Um, but, you know, structures. Um, High tunnels have kind of fit in that gray area, that, but they, they won't fund them at, at the farmer level, farmer grant level. Uh, projects with no direct link to sustainability, but don't let this, this limit you too much. Um, remember the, the three principles of sustainability, uh, profitability, uh, managing your resources wisely, and farmer lifestyle. So if it fits into any of those things, then it can have a direct link to sustainability. Um, one, one example is uh, a project that they, they basically raised uh, beds for a farmer that had a, uh, a, a bad back, so he didn't have to bend over as much. Um, and it was innovative for that, you know, what he was doing. Um, so it improved that farmer's lifestyle. 
it made it more sustainable for him to do year after year. So it's kind of, you, you got to get outside the box of what you might think sustainability is. It's not, I know this is an organic conference, but most of the time we're trying to tell people it's not just organic. It doesn't need to just be that aspect of sustainability. Um, they can't fund projects with little or unclear benefit to other farmers, so it's important to sell what you want to do as it applies to other farmers around you. It can't only benefit your farm. If you have such a specific problem um, that Sarah, Sarah's not going to be able to fund just to help a single farmer. The idea is that it's going to help other farmers as well. So they can put a little bit of money into you, which will benefit you for supplies and labor, uh, but then in long term it's going to help the farmers around you as well. They do not fund proposals that replicate techniques already known to be effective unless it's new to your region. Uh, so it, the most common examples for this are variety trials, because uh, different regions, different microclimates, different varieties will outperform other ones. So even if it's done you know, in, in a neighboring region, even a neighboring state, and this can be different techniques as well, it doesn't need to be variety trials. But if it's innovative to your area, then it's something that they can fund, or potentially fund. And just one that's always on there, it's got to be said, is they can't fund past recipients who are behind in the reporting. Um, we'll get a little into that a little bit more later. Types of projects funded, and now this is just kind of a list to get people's minds going about all the diverse things that they can fund, they have funded, but really it's, it's not a definitive list. Uh, new production techniques, strategies, adoption in Northeast, et cetera, or in your region. Marketing of new products, value added, invention of equipment, education, outreach, and demonstration. And I, I'm not going to go through all these, uh, but you can just kind of glance over this real quick, all the diverse things that they have funded. And I'm just going to go through these examples real quick. Uh, there's some that are going to be in the greater northeast region and then some for Maryland and Delaware as well. Uh, Vermont, a breeding club, developing varieties, and this is a, again, this is a common thing that we see. And this is basically their outreach and on-farm demonstration. It's usually the easiest, easiest way to do it, uh, and even if you're doing other forms of outreach, you, a lot of times you might as well just include this. Extension uh, staff often want to get these on-farm uh, workshops going, so you can, it's kind of a win-win situation. Uh, this one is from Maryland, uh, in Berlin, Maryland, uh, the oyster big flip float. Uh, he basically came up with the idea, uh, designed it, and built it himself so that he could just flip the float over so that the, uh, what do they call it, um, basically so that the, the, uh, it wouldn't get too uh, rotted, um, like yucking or something. Yeah, it was basically the bottom. Uh, develops algae all over it, so just by flipping it, it dries out. You don't have to go through the whole process of uh, disturbing, disturbing all the oysters and everything. You can just take it, flip it, and move on to the next one. Uh, this one is in Maine, and I just left this one in here to kind of show you. It's also with oysters, but it's a very different aspect of it as opposed to just kind of a technical equipment or invention. Uh, this is more addressing a specific infestation or specific problem. Uh, grazing systems, obviously this could be used for any type of livestock. This one's also in Maryland. Uh, economical climate control for extended production and high tunnel vertical growing. So they're basically using alternative energy to uh, work in their situation. Um, this one is in uh, Bridgeville, Delaware. Um, this is a very uh, sim simple uh, project, you might say. And a, a lot of the ones we see are, are nice and simple like this. And for a reviewer, sometimes it's, it's nice. It's a little bit easier to get behind one that you're confident a farmer can do. All he did was do one, one plot facing uh, north-south, the other plot, face, plot facing east-west, and then just took basically just took yield data. Um, 
and the east-west rows really outperform the north-south ones quite a bit. You can see uh, on the right, on the right is uh, the uh, north-south, and on the left is the east-west rows. So you can tell just by looking at how much how much growth is on the on the vines, which one outperformed. Early sweet corn transplants from 2003 in Vermont. This is something that we've actually started promoting in, in Delaware as well. Uh, in the professional development program, we're trying to promote season extension, and this is one way to do it. Uh, it really took off up there, and it's starting to seem like it has some application here. Obviously, it's a little bit more upfront cost, but then you're having product available when there's little competition. And there's another on-farm uh, demonstration. Uh, this is another invention just converted a tractor to be electric, and then just published how to do it online. And that, that was basically their whole project. All right, this is the application part. Baron's gonna come take it for a little while. Uh, the application's about as easy as an application you're gonna have. Here are the 10 questions. This is your entire application. Um, everything's online now. You submit it all online. You wanna do it with your technical advisor, but. Go ahead, Baron. Thanks, Jason. And uh, as, you, as you saw uh, from the uh, previous slides, there are quite a bit of diversity uh, that you can have with the different types of uh, projects. Uh, now, uh, now we're going to talk about the farmer application uh, process. And basically, it can be broken out into three different components. Uh, first, you have your summary or your abstract. And, and if I'd like to mention, too, that the application process is actually done online. I think this was up until, what, last year? Is that about right? Uh, yeah. This okay. Year was all online. This, this past year, or this past round of applications, everything was submitted online. And so from this point onward, uh, the application process is going to be online. And just to mention, so we don't forget, also the, your letter from your technical advisor, you also submit electronically as a PDF, your how-to write guides, um, we haven't handed out yet, but they're still outdated, and they say that you just mail them, but you don't need to do that. Sorry about that, guys. No, that's fine. So uh, basically, as I mentioned, it pretty much is broken out into three different components, and I wish we could have showed it uh, on the screen, but you're not able to get into the system at this point, and that will not open up until later on this year. But basically, it starts out by the, the farmer putting in the summary of the abstract. And basically, in about 250 words or less, they're supposed to put together a general overview of what uh, the particular project is about. So I always kind of figure this is a very important component because it's pretty much that hook. Uh, I don't know how many people have seen the uh, show Shark Tank. Is anybody familiar with that, that show? It comes on towards the end of the week. Uh, but basically, uh, the person comes out and you have these investors uh, there, and that person is given maybe about three to five minutes to kind of sell his idea. And so basically, that's how important this summary of this abstract is uh, for the farmer. It's, just, it's the hook that will get reviewers to want to look further into the application. Then next is followed by a series of seven questions uh, and outline just as you see it. What is the problem? Why is it important? Uh, basically, uh, we want to know uh, what, what, what is the issue that you're trying to raise and, and pretty much what do you plan to do about solving it? So it's really important that you address all these questions. Uh, going down further, uh, uh, what will your, your methods be? And I'm not taking them in any particular order, but basically in this section here, uh, we want to know, uh, the reviewers want to know rather, uh, what are your steps that you plan to take in chronological order or the events or activities that you plan to carry out in order to achieve your objectives. Uh, then moving on forward, another uh, important component is there's uh, uh, verse uh, uh, number eight. Uh, what is your outreach plan? And basically, and I think Jason probably mentioned it uh, earlier, but in all of the farmer applications, they would like to see what type of outreach do you plan to carry out? And basically what that is, whatever the results or outcomes from your particular project or proposal, how is it going to benefit the community? Uh, even if the project is not successful, it's always good to kind of get the information out there. And this can be done by way of field days. It could be done by maybe putting them in newsletters. Uh, this is where your technical advisor could come into play to kind of help you get the word out. But it's really good to come out with some type of outreach plan or strategy. Now, at this particular time, uh, well, last but not least, then we have our third component, and that's the budget 
And of course, this is where you'll have a sample budget that you will have to put together and pretty much uh, uh, provide a justification as to the expenses that you have. But now at this time, if you notice at the beginning, we passed out some exercises because I thought this was pretty important because I've had a chance to actually be a reviewer on one of the, uh, the past uh, year uh, round of grants. And one thing we found is that in the series of questions, there are some key questions that always throw farmers for a loop. And so I'm pass, I, we've passed out to everyone certain questions. I believe we have question one, we have question two, and we have also question four. Uh, what we found is that in those particular questions, they've always seemed to, uh, farmers may not have been able to provide enough information or not know exactly what to report in these particular categories. So what I wanted to do at this time is if we can maybe just take a few moments maybe three, three minutes or so, let's actually look at the question one. Uh, what we have here up front, and I don't think we had a chance to pass this out, but just these types of examples are actually in the a little booklet talking about how to write a, uh, a SARE application proposal. And one thing I like about this particular booklet because it gives examples just like this and it kind of gives you pros as to what's, what reviewers look for, what's considered a good response and what would be considered kind of a mediocre or not, not the best type response. So uh, very, very helpful information. So now we're going to go ahead and just kind of talk about the application procedure. Uh, when do the grants normally, uh, when does the request go out? Uh, typically, if I'm not mistaken, I think it, it opens up uh, sometime, I think in late, is it late summer, maybe perhaps, or first of fall? They're going to open it up earlier. This past year it was opened up late. It wasn't until like November or something. Right, it was a little late this past time, but it should, I would think it, I would think it would go out sometime later on in the, in the, in the summer, summer months. Uh, the deadline is always December 1st. Uh, that's the submission deadline, and, and as I mentioned before, it is an online submission. The application will be the same, though, so it's not like, a, you don't need to wait until it opens up to work on it. You should have to be working on it, and then once, the, once it's online, you can just enter it. Right. Did everyone hear that? Uh, the, the 2012 application that we just passed out to you now, these questions are not going to change. And, this is, and that was pretty much the application online. So you pretty much have the information already. So this is something you can already begin to get you know, working on. And if, if you're thinking of an idea, uh, you can kind of uh, use these questions. And, and pretty much when it's time to come out, you already have your information there to submit. Uh, the, the, uh, the review team uh, is normally compiled uh, normally in November, December. Uh, they will review the, the applications and this is done between the months of uh, December and March. Uh, they make a determination as to which applications will be awarded uh, in, Mar in March of the following year. Uh, they will be notified if they were rejected or awarded. Uh, and then the contracts will, will begin to be issued beginning in April. So as we see, it's a pretty quick turnaround. It's a pretty quick turnaround. This is the, the website, and actually it's been updated a little bit, and we'll get, actually get a chance to go into that a little bit. As mentioned before, a lot of the, 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 public, a lot of the publications and the information that we passed out today is available online at the uh, Northeast Sierra website. It's a very uh, user friendly. It's easy to maneuver around in to find to find the information. Uh, what we've what we've been talking about up to this point, we've been talking about the grants, the farmer grants. So if you go right straight to the main website, click on grants, click on get a grant, then that'll take you to uh, this page. Then you can move over to the. There you go. Then click on the the farmer grant. And the good thing I like about it is to the right, or to your right, you'll see it has here for applicants. And pretty much a lot of the information that we've passed out to you today is located right here. So everything is located right here online. So 
uh, going back then to the uh, to the PowerPoint, what is the role of the ag service providers or the technical uh, service providers? Uh, well, one, if you're a farmer applicant, you definitely want to make sure that you select an advisor that is familiar with the particular uh, venture or project that you're doing. So let's say if you're in, if you're doing a, a project on maybe free range poultry, perhaps. Uh, you definitely want to find someone that's knowledgeable of that particular subject, maybe uh, uh, an extension specialist that you know specializes in poultry, perhaps. Um, if you're looking at doing maybe something with soils, uh, you may want to consider someone from NRCS or Soil Conservation District. Uh, but the key is, is that you want to find a technical advisor that's going to contribute to the particular project. Now keep in mind, this person wouldn't be the lead person taking over the project, but they will play an instrumental role in, in perhaps maybe reviewing over your application, making some suggestions if, if need be, uh, maybe helping the farmer to come up with a, maybe a test trial as to how to conduct his experiment, uh, maybe in collecting the data, how is he going to collect it. These are the things that the uh, technical advisor's role would, would definitely play. And also, as mentioned here, the second point, uh, the technical advisor can be paid from, these particular, uh, from this particular grant. Uh, of course, not a, out of the whole grant, let's say if a farmer is applying for $15,000, of course, you know, all of that wouldn't go directly to the, uh, to the technical advisor. So the reviewer, reviewers would definitely want to look at it and make sure that you know, a, a, a reasonable amount is allotted, allotted to that. Now let's say if you have a particular project where uh, the, uh, the technical advisor would perhaps be the lead person to take advantage of, of uh, some type of experiment that he might be uh, doing at, uh, at his research farm or perhaps, then he could be eligible to apply for a partnership grant. And that partnership grant is where the technical advisor would be the lead, but yet the farmer would be the one that he will be doing the test plot with. And so what we're going to do at this time is have Jason, I guess, come back up and he'll kind of take it from here and talk a little bit about the partnership grant. Um, before, before we do the partnership grant, just real quick, the re review process, um, it's a team of four. Uh, review members, there's very diverse, uh, usually a farmer, technical committee, somebody on the advisory council of SARE. Um, they get together and they rank uh, about 20 proposals each team and then uh, they have a conference call and then they can adjust their scores based on uh, you know, certain people's uh, input and knowledge. They do discuss the proposals after they rank them individually. Um, and it, the, you can change your scores, so sometimes somebody has some more knowledge about an area and then uh, we can adjust that. But normally the, the reviewer score is uh, independent for the most part. Um, proposals are based on merit, not on balancing of geography, but uh, I've said to a couple people, it, Delaware and Maryland are underrepresented uh, to SARE, so if th there's a tie, then it'll usually go towards us. Um, the criteria for review, this stuff is, is in the books that you have. Um, in some of those exercises we went over, just uh, put yourself in the reviewer's um, chair. Um, if you were a reviewer, how would you see these proposals? That's kind of what uh, the, the purpose of those things, so you can sell your, sell your ideas a little bit better. Um, and all this is, is in your thing. We're kind of running low on time, so we started a little late, so we'll just kind of go ahead of this. Uh, partnership grants are very similar. I'm going to go through this pretty quickly as well so then we can have some time for questions and feedback. Um, they're very similar uh, to the farmer grants in principle and application as well. Uh, th the good thing about them is that the, the, uh, your technical advisor or the, usually somebody from Extension, they do a lot more of the work for you. You just do the labor on the farm and you can still get paid for supplies and your labor. Deadline is a month earlier though, so keep that in mind. And you can see the nine steps and questions are very similar, so I'm not, not going to waste our time going through them. And the criteria and review are very similar as well. Uh, real quick, some common feedback for partnership grants and for farmer grants, if the problem is specific only to the farmer. These are things that we see time and time again, and I've mentioned that before. Uh, farmer interest is not supported or 
other other farmers won't be interested in, in what you're doing. If the, you can't sell the idea that others will want to follow suit, then uh, it's not going to fly. Uh, you need to provide details and follow proposal directions. It's amazing how we can have an online application and the questions are right there and somehow people still don't follow uh, the directions of what they're supposed to put in each one. It's just kind of a simple thing. You've got to take your time and just do it right. Uh, your idea needs to be innovative and, is in, and its impact shown. Impact to other farmers, impact to, to your life or to your profitability or to uh, the natural resources. Uh, questionable qualifications of the applicant. This is one of those areas, sometimes people are, are, are modest, maybe a little too modest, they don't sell themselves up enough, they don't defend that they can really get these things done. You need to prove to people that you, you have the knowledge, the ability to get it done. Uh, sometimes the idea is too big for a grant size. If you want to try, you know, 12 different things out on your farm, the reviewers are going to see that and say, you know, maybe that's just, this just isn't realistic. You got to have a, 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 a reasonable, reasonable goal. Uh, for more information, the, these contact information you can get uh, from us. They're also, though Cara Delaney's in the book, you can get um, my business card or Barron's as well. Uh, we, we want you to contact us. Carol Delaney is very responsive, so, so are we. Um, but it, it's a, for a grant organization, if you email or call her, she'll almost definitely get back to you in, in a business day or two. Um, that's just one of Sarah's real uh, strengths is is their promptness in, in, in uh, getting back to farmers. Um, so I think we're just going to kind of open it up to people if they have questions and uh, if people have a specific ideas of uh, a grant, we can kind of show you the process of what you might want to do to search Sarah's database. Keep in mind you don't only want to do research at Sarah's website but you want to do research and extension, uh, other, other projects that have been done uh, to, to prove that you uh, really have done, done your homework. I'm going to bring, I'm going to bring up the uh, national page right now. So does anybody have any questions or any ideas? Yeah. I just have a question. If, if this is a national program, um, let's say you have people across the country which are think that they're independently addressing a certain issue and then you realize from this perspective that you have 10 people all interested in researching something but they're the only 10 people in the country that are doing that. Do you in any way put them together in communication, contact, or not? Uh, are, you, are you asking, should you contact the people that have done no, other? I'm asking, if you have a project and you think that it's a great idea and no one else is doing it, but there are five other people who think it's a great idea, but nobody is communicating because no one else knows that they exist, but it, from your perspective, you can see that they do exist. Is there any means of connecting those people? Um, I, I don't. I don't know if there's any any way to really uh, to connect people that haven't uh, addressed it. There are um, like if you search these project reports, um, you can search the database. You can put in your idea, and you can come up with a whole bunch of uh, projects that have been done in that area and you can contact them to see their points of view. Um, you don't necessarily need to find uh, people that are ready to buy into your idea definitively um, to, to a, you know, sell it to the, the review. It just needs to be reasonable that other farmers would have a reason to be interested in what you're doing. Okay. I, I guess I, I just see that if you have five people, four people lose out and they get nothing, but what they could get is the opportunity to work with other, three other people. Um, at least in discussion and communication, because if you're intrinsic, intrinsically interested in it, then even if you don't get the grant, you're still interested in it. Well, that's where, um, and just kind of add on what Jason said, that's the purpose of all, all of the awardees are, 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 are put into this database that, that everybody can go to. So whatever, you know, if you're interested in doing, growing shiitake mushrooms, let's just say if you have you know, 10 people that try to do a shiitake mushroom project and five of them got awarded. Uh, they will be put into that database and all of their information will be put there as far as, you know, the reports, you know, how they went about the project, you know, what different aspect that they, you know, uh, take on it. And so that information is available. 
and they also put out success stories, of course, you know, uh, from select regions. So even though there's not necessarily, and I guess I see the question that you're asking, even though there's not necessarily a form that's put together for, for ones to kind of connect, I guess that's kind of done on their own, I would think, because that information is available, and that is one source they can go to to find others who are doing it and who perhaps may be doing it well. Yeah, it's, as I mentioned, you know, it's very user friendly. Um, uh, and I think Jason mentioned at the beginning, uh, SARE has four different regions. You have the Western region, you have the North Central, you have the Northeast, which we're a part of, and then you have the Southern region. Each region kind of acts independently from the other. However, we still have the national, we're still under the national umbrella of, you know, of course, SARE. And so this particular website that he's going to is the actual national website, and that's where you can go to and put in your information of whatever topic, title that you might be interested in. And when, that, when you put it in this database, then that pulls information from across all four regions. So you're not just getting information just for this particular region, but across the board. And another good thing about this is that you can even filter it out. So if you just want to know what's going on or what has been done in the past just in this region, then you can filter that out as well. And I'd like to say that even if you're not planning on applying for a grant, that there's just a lot of information there and production related information and results. And um, so it, it's a great place to go just to, to glean information from. Their publications are great. Yeah. So I'm just trying to show you a couple examples, but this is really be your first step. If you have an idea, or even if you just want to know about something that's been done, go to the website, search the, the SARE.org, SARE the national one. You go to project reports and search the database, and this comes up, and you can change the regions. You can change, you can pick an individual state. You can really do anything. There's just thousands of reports that have been done. And as I mentioned to you before, you know, there could be some of these projects where, you know, they may have really good intent, but the outcomes were not good. But yet that's still, you know, good information for the farmer to perhaps, you know, use. Um, real quick, while I'm looking at this, there's annual reports on here and there's also the final reports as long as they submit in. But I, I think uh, we kind of glanced over uh, the reporting process. Um, if you get the grant, uh, as you're going along with the project, you can submit up to 50% of your receipts, including your labor, and get reimbursed up to 50%. Um, and the turnaround for checks is, is within a week. It's really fast. Um, and then once your final report is in, you get the remaining 50%. And again, it's usually you know, a, a couple business days, and you'll have that check in the mail. It's, it's not one of those things you're going to have to fight for. As long as you do what you said you were going to do, you're going to get your money. Did everyone understand that? Ba ba basically, if, you, if you're awarded a grant, $15,000, they're not going to cut you a check for $15,000. Yep. Um, question. Does anyone come out and take pictures or, uh, of, the, of the, what you're trying to prove or, or your, you know, your, your summary or whatever? Or, I mean, how does that work? Yeah, um, Carol, Carol Delaney will come to your farm, um, and she, she almost always takes pictures. Um, usually, if I'm in your region, I will, you know, almost definitely come to your farm, or Barron, or um, your local SARE representative. Not necessarily, but um, usually that's definitely, a, that's definitely part of it. They're not going to use those photos, you know, they're not going to put your photos on the website or something like that without your permission. Um, it's just for their own documentation. You know, it might take six months or something. I guess there'd be several times where you, they keep in touch with you and that kind of thing as far as how, how it's coming and whatnot. Sure, sure, sure. And then, of course, that's, that's where also the technical advisor would come into play as well, you see. Because we may not specialize in that particular, uh, but, but we would at least put them in touch with ones that would be able to assist. And, and Carol would probably only come out the one time. I, she, she usually goes out once. And, again, she's... She's a really friendly, friendly lady. She's not, you know, coming to give you a hard time or, you know, you know, try to prove that you're not doing something right. She's just coming to, you know, filling her, fulfilling her duties, Sarah's duties, making things, making sure things really are where they are and, you know, making, 
making sure you're, you're happy with the, the situation as well. Okay, we have no further questions. Thank you for your time.